So this is White Sands, New Mexico right here. Um, and there's a lot of dunes formed out here in, in White Sands. It's a pretty cool place. Uh, has anybody been to New Mexico before? No? New Mexico is a beautiful state. Uh, those are the mountains there in the background. And I'm actually, well, I was standing on, on a sand dune right there. Um, it's, a, it's a really beautiful place. Today we're going to talk about deserts and wind and what they do to the landscape. And of course, the quiz is up on its learning. You can just pull that open and answer the questions as we go here. Another picture of the dunes. Look at the little ripples there. Remember, we talked some how ripple marks might form in rocks. Like if that became solidified into a rock, you could end up with ripple marks in there from a sand dune. Um, White Sands is a pretty unique place. Uh, it's uh, out there is where we actually have tested a lot of uh, nuclear weapons happened out there near there. Um, we've actually tested, there's a big testing ground for the Air Force out here. Uh, while I was walking around out there, there's all sorts of signs that say, uh, you know, watch out for unexploded ordnance. So if you find a little bit of metal in the, buried in the sand someplace, like don't pick it up because it might just blow up. Um, and at some point out there, there's actually a, a cordoned off area where you're not allowed to walk at all because uh, the Air Force uh, still actively uses it for testing uh, munitions and things. So uh, I don't know where that was at exactly because I didn't have a GPS when I was walking around, but at some point there were some big aircrafts flying overhead and I was like, oh, maybe I've gone a little too far into the, into the sand. <laughs> it's time to turn around. So uh, it's pretty neat. There's little tiny little shrubberies that kind of grow out here and there's weird little dunes that'll form around them as well. Um, it's kind of cool. As a tree gets buried by a sand dune, because sand dunes migrate, they migrate in the di direction that the wind's blowing from, right? or the direction the wind's blowing. So uh, if there's like a tree or, or any sort of obstruction on the landscape, the sand dune will start to bury it as it moves. Um, now trees, what's interesting is if the sand dune buries it slowly enough, the tree will keep blowing, growing taller and taller and taller um, to this like really weird height. And then as the sand dune gets blown away and passes by, you have this like sole solitary bush or tree or something just standing up, like almost like on a stilt. It's, it's real bizarre to see. Um, but we're gonna talk a little bit about dune formation. We'll talk a little bit about how wind weathers our landscape uh, in these arid climates. So uh, the first thing that's maybe going to be a little bit surprising is that the primary force of weathering uh, the thing that breaks down rocks into sand and gravel and bits and, and, and breaks apart the materials of the landscape is actually mechanical weathering. And the main weathering factor in the desert is actually water. Sounds strange, doesn't it? Since water is kind of something you don't have a lot of in the desert, it's strange to think that water causes most of the landforms in the desert. Um, the, the fact is, is that while it doesn't rain very often, when it does, the water floods through the area and creates flash floods. It carries away material because there's really no plant roots to, to hold it down. So it just like washes away really fast, which is why you can have um, a really completely uh, you know, empty arroyo, and then all of a sudden there's this flash flood that flows through it. It's, it's never good to camp in a stream valley, like a dry stream bed in the desert because it could rain 100 miles away, and all of a sudden a flash flood rips through and you're gone. So uh, it, that is one of the, one of the dangers of, of camping in the desert. But chemical weathering is almost completely absent in the desert. So chemical weathering being like what happens a lot around here. We've got a lot of moisture, a lot of humidity, and the rain and the water has chemical reactions with acids and things like that, and it breaks down the rocks, which is why we get caves, it's why our monuments all kind of degrade after time. Like if you go to Washington DC, you'll see a lot of that limestone and marble. It's kind of really, really weathered. That's chemical weathering. But since the desert doesn't have um, the continual water that we have because of the climate, um, they, don't have, they don't have much chemical weathering down there at all. Um, there is some, but not, not a lot um, in the desert. So uh, mechanical weathering in major, most of it's done through, through water which is strange. So these desert streams, uh, I mentioned this up here, are ephemeral. And the meaning of that word is that they only carry water after it rains, which is why, like I said, you can have a flash flood. Um, it can rain uh, a little ways away from you. You don't even know that it rains. And all of a sudden, your tent and you wash away. Um, it's actually very dangerous. Uh, 
when you have when you have a flash flood in the desert. But the streams are ephemeral; they don't flow. And we've kind of had some experience with that around here lately. It's been really dry, and uh, it's raining this morning, of course. And uh, I don't know if it'll be enough to fill up the streams, but if do any of you guys have streams near your house at all? I bet they're really low, or there's just no water in them at all. Okay. So maybe it'll rain enough that it will fill up the water table, and those streams will start to flow again. Um, I don't know, but we've had a, a drought here for a good little bit. Okay, so here's a stream, uh, a dry stream bed, uh, before and after a heavy rainfall in the desert. So you can see here, uh, this catch basin, all these mountains are collecting rainwater, and it's got nowhere to go. So once it falls on that rock, it runs down the slopes, and it collects, and it starts to flood through this valley. And you can see where the old stream used to run, on the picture on the left, and on the right, there's the flash flood. Now, this stuff happens crazy fast. The first time I saw one of these, it blew my mind. Like, I had no idea that water levels could rise that fast um, and that, uh, with that much velocity. Um, I was actually rafting down the Grand Canyon on the Colorado River, and it started raining, and it rained, it rained a good little bit. And this is, of course, in the desert, right? Um, and the canyon's huge, so you can't see what's happening up on the upper part of the canyon, up on the plateau. So we rafted through the rain for a bit, and uh, after a while it stopped raining, and then the sides of the canyon just opened up with these huge waterfalls that poured off the top because it had rained up top. And the water didn't soak into the soil, it just ran right off and came off the edges of the canyon. It was beautiful, right? Later on that night we were camped out on a little sandbar, and my buddy Mac and I were walking around some, and it had started to rain again. Um, earlier in the day, we actually walked up a little slot canyon to see one of these waterfalls. It was just kind of trickling a little bit. There wasn't a whole lot coming out, but you could stand underneath of it and get wet a little bit from the very top of the canyon. The water droplets were falling pretty far. And there was, of course, a little stream bed. It was almost totally dry, like just a little trickle was running in it, and it ran out to the main Colorado River. And uh, as we stood there, the sky darkened, and you could tell that it was raining someplace in the distance that we couldn't see. Um, and all of a sudden, like that, that waterfall started flowing, like considerably flowing. And we walked out to the mouth of it, kind of where it was meeting the Colorado River, and stood there. And over the course of like 10 minutes is all it took, that water went from a trickle to like three or four feet deep. It was moving like maybe sand to begin with as it started to increase. But at some point, it was rolling boulders the size of basketballs or bigger. And you could feel them. It was bizarre. You're standing on the side of this creek and you hear thunk, 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 as these giant rocks are rolling down and then getting tossed into the Colorado River. Um, had I been standing inside that creek that was totally dry just minutes before, uh, my ankles would have been broken off and I would have drowned. Like it would have just crushed me, these boulders that were rolling down. We had a great time picking up big rocks and throwing them in the water and like listening to them hit the bottom and then start rolling down and get deposited in the Colorado River. Um, it was really fun. But those can, those can happen really fast and be pretty dangerous. Uh, so in the desert and in the, ba in, in the basin and range areas, most streams don't ever, ever actually make it out to the ocean. Like when you think about a stream or a river um, around here, like let's take Clifty Creek for an example, okay? You could follow Clifty Creek out to the White River and you could follow the White River uh, I believe it's the Ohio or the Illinois, it dumps into, and eventually into the Illinois, and then eventually that will run all the way out to the ocean. So yes, you could totally put a canoe in here in Columbus, in the creek right behind our school, and it might take a little while, and you'd have to cross over some dams probably and some things like that, but you could paddle yourself all the way to the ocean. Pretty neat, huh? So in most places on our, on our, on our continent, that's the case but not in, in the interior regions where you have um, these deserts. The streams just dry up before they ever get there. And our damming them has made it a lot worse. The Colorado River used to reach all the way down out the Gulf there in Southern California and, and dump into the ocean. It doesn't happen anymore. We take so much water out of it because we've dammed it up that there's no water that actually reaches the ocean anymore. What does that mean for the ecology and the animals and the, the people that live there, right? It's, it's really not a good situation. So what happens in the interior as these things drain off? 
are a couple of features that we might see. Uh, one is called an alluvial fan, and it's a, a, because it fans out. Um, it's a deposit of sediment that forms when a stream slope is abruptly reduced. So if you see that, that mountain range that was kind of in the background, those pictures, where the water runs right off of that, if it just spreads out and deposits, it'll make this big fan-shaped thing. Kind of looks like a delta, but it's on dry land. Uh, and then there's another thing here, a playa lake. These are really unique, pretty cool things. I'm gonna show you some pictures of these. It's a flat area on the floor of an undrained desert, okay? Um, when, it, when it doesn't have water in it, it's known as a playa, which I think is Spanish for beach. Anybody wanna correct me on that? Pretty sure it means, means like beach in, in, in Spanish. Um, so after heavy rain, that can actually fill up, usually like we're talking a couple inches at most of water. Like they don't fill super deep for the most part. It is the desert. Um, so uh, playa lakes are kind of a unique feature. They are some of the most perfectly flat places on our entire planet. If you, if you take out the ocean basins, which are pretty, pretty flat, these are like the flattest areas on the surface of land. In fact, every single land speed record that's ever been set has been set on one of these playa lakes, lake beds for the most part. Like you see those pictures of those guys in those crazy elongated cars where they like basically have a rocket engine strapped to the back of them and they're setting land speed records. Uh, it happens on these playa lake basins, okay, on these, on these uh, playas. Super, super, super flat. Okay, here is me on a playa. This is actually a very, very famous playa. Uh, this is in Death Valley. Um, and it's dry right now, so I, we wouldn't call it a playa lake. Um, you can see the mountains back behind there. This is one of the strangest places I've ever been in my life. It was very, very weird being out here. So my wife and I, we were driving across the country in our, in our truck, and we decided we wanted to venture into Death Valley. And not like the main roads through Death Valley, we drove back into the back and beyond of Death Valley. Um, and I've never felt in my life, anywhere that I've been on the planet, more so than here, that like I was an astronaut. Like really, truly, it felt like being an astronaut. I had a backpack on my back there, it had water in it, and I could, I could feel like it was my lifeline. If that ran out and I was stuck out there for a couple of days, it was game over. Um, this area is so hostile. I mean, they don't call it Death Valley for nothing, right? There's areas out there that have names like the Furnace and the Crucible and things like that. Um, people die out here. It's, it's, it's a dangerous place. And I, I could really feel it. Like we were completely alone out here in the middle of this vast desert. And we landed on this playa, got to this playa lake. This is actually known as racetrack playa um, because it's a, a famous, famous location because of a mystery that happened here. So uh, if you look, you can't quite see it in this picture. I've got some, hopefully I've got some photos here. Um, in the far back, there's a couple little, they look like little big rocks. They're actually boulders. Some of them are the size of like beach balls. They're, they're large, like a couple of feet even in diameter. And these rocks, leave little trails in this hardened desert mud here. And they travel across the mud. Uh, nobody's actually witnessed them moving, which is weird, right? So the question is how in the world do they move across this flat, um, completely dry uh, playa? Well, they obviously come from, and I walked across some of these, uh, they obviously are tumbling down out of the mountains over here and landing onto the playa. But there were a lot of questions, a lot of hypotheses as to how they actually moved. Um, and it was neat following some of the trails go on for like a long, long ways, like hundreds and hundreds of yards. And sometimes they, the rocks stop, you can see the trail stop, turn at a right angle and go a different direction. Like they don't just go one way, they migrate kind of around and they migrate in unison. So if one rock's going one way, another rock's going the same, all the rocks are kind of going the same way. So what scientists have kind of, finally arrived at is that in periods of time when it does rain enough to flood this playa, which is not very often, the mud down there that's all cracked that you see I'm sitting on becomes really slick. And if there's high winds, the little rocks kind of act like sails and they scoot along very gradually on the surface of the playa lake bed. <clears throat> at least that's what we think happens. Like I said, Nobody's really certain. I mean, nobody's seen it actually occur before. And it's kind of mysterious. It's kind of a cool thing. So 
I don't know if I've got a picture of myself in here. I'll, I'll pull up a picture of me running around on the Playa Lake. It's pretty cool. Yep. Here's a picture of an alluvial fan. Okay. Um, picture of an alluvial fan. So the water that runs down out of these mountain regions is carrying material, and it just kind of fans out like this. You see it look like little, little A's almost. There's Death Valley there where I was just at in that picture. You see where we're at here, San Fran up here. Um, so we're in California, just across the border from Nevada. Uh, really, really interesting place. Okay, most desert erosion, I just mentioned this before, is the result of running water. Okay, that's the answer to your next question. Um, although wind erosion is more significant in deserts than elsewhere, like there's more wind erosion in a desert than there is around here by far, water still does most of the erosional work. And it's a strange concept because you know there's not much water in the desert. But when there is water in the desert, it tears up the desert really quick. And yes, there's wind erosion there. We're gonna talk about some of the erosion by the wind because it's very unique. But, but by far and away, running water is the biggest eroding force in the entire desert region. Okay. Everybody have that one? Good? Okay, so let's talk about wind erosion here a little bit. There's two ways that uh, wind erodes things. One is called deflation and the other is called abrasion. Okay, they're kind of weird words, but what deflation is, it's the lifting and removal of, of light, loose particles of, of clay and silt, um, and it produces these areas called blowouts. Like it, it blows all of the light stuff out of a little spot. And when it does that, it leaves behind this stuff called desert pavement. Has anybody been to a desert before? Nobody's ever been to a desert before? Oh my goodness, go to a desert sometime. Deserts are so unique, especially if you're from Indiana, because there's nothing around here that's anything like a desert. But you walk around on a desert, and it's, it's typically not just a bunch of sand, unless you're in dunes. If you're walking around a desert, it's pretty harsh, like there's, there's cacti everywhere, right? Like spiny plants that you, you don't really want to touch. And the ground itself, it's not so much sandy as it is like rocks, like, like pebbles, little pebbles everywhere. And the pebbles are almost like baked into the ground. So it's almost like you're walking on pavement when you walk around in a desert. It's very hard stuff. Um, so that's what desert pavement is. So they, the, this kind of hard, heavier stuff gets left behind and the lighter stuff blows away. Okay, blowouts, deflation, pavement. The other way wind erodes things is through a process called abrasion. So this is essentially sandblasting. Oh, here's a picture of some deflation here. Um, deflation can be dramatic. Um, during the Great Dust Bowl, right, um, during all that time period in US history, you might have learned about that in history class, portions of, of, uh, of the land in the US had huge blowouts. The, the winds blew, the crops died, there was, there was uh, lots and lots of erosion. The land dropped in areas, sometimes like three to four feet down. Like, like that much of the land just blew away. And you can see how this pavement forms here. If you keep blowing away all the little stuff, eventually you're left with kind of this hard layer of, of little pebbles on top. And it, it's pretty tough stuff. If you dig through that, you're back to like the original stuff again. There's little stuff underneath. Okay, and there's a picture of some desert pavement. Okay. That's deflation. So let's talk about this um, wind abrading some stuff and some other things here. So when the wind deposits sediments, um, th these things form like layers. They can form sand dunes. Um, they can form this stuff known as luss. Uh, luss is just really fine wind-blown silt. So it's not sand, it's finer than sand. And it can make these huge extensive blankets across the United States. There's two main ways that lust gets made. One is from deserts getting deflated and all that really, really fine stuff blows away. Um, so the other way is, is from glaciers. As glaciers grind up the rock they pass over, they make all that rock flower. And as they leave, all of that stuff blows. 
and it blows and it dusts over vast, vast areas. Most of the most of the lust deposits in the U.S. across the Midwestern states, which is where we're at, are from the retreat of those last glaciers during the Wisconsin Ice Age. Uh, that that material, that lust, is actually tremendously, tremendously fertile. Like it is the best stuff to grow crops in, which is why the United States has this phenomenal cropland across its central section because the glaciers deposited all this stuff. But deserts can do it as well. Big deserts, uh, the material that blows off of them lands in places like um, there's deserts that are right now feeding the Amazon. And that's how the Amazon remains as fertile as it does. Okay, so uh, it's a really important part of our, of our, of our earth and our, the processes that happen on our earth. Uh, sand dunes are another type of deposit. Obviously, this is sand. And the way this occurs is through a process known as saltation. It's kind of a funny name, like a salt shaker. Kind of looks like that too. So these are little bits of mostly quartz that get bumped along. Uh, if you've ever laid on a beach before on a, on a blanket and the wind picked up, you have seen saltation probably right in your face because the sand grains, they don't get lifted very high in the air, but if you're down and your face is close to the beach, you notice like they start bouncing along. They literally like bounce from grain to grain, kind of hopping along until they end up in your eyeball, right? Or on your towel. Well, they keep doing that. For instance, up on the shores of Lake Michigan where the sand dunes form up there. Has anybody been up to the Indiana dunes, Michigan dunes? Oh, I just got back from there. It's beautiful, it's an amazing place walking up and down those big, huge dunes, so cool. Well, there's this big fetch across the Lake Michigan going all the way from Chicago. The winds blow uh, from the west to the east. And so they blow across that big open fetch of water and they hit the shore where there's a bunch of sand and they start bouncing that sand and it bounces and bounces and bounces and up and it starts to build up this big mound. Well, there's kind of two sides to a sand dune. And if you visit sand dunes, you, you will see this. You will walk up one side of the sand dune and it will be very gradually sloped. That's the side that faces the wind. That's the side the little sand grains are saltating up. They're bouncing their way up to the top. On the back side of the dune, the uh, leeward side, the sand grains are piling up, piling up, piling up, and then they avalanche down, they slide down. It's called a slip face. So the angle can only be a certain amount, something around about 45 degrees, before the sand just starts to slide down. And it's super fun because you can climb to the top of these dunes um, and it's a long climb all the way up this gradual slope and on the backside it just drops off. So you can get running really fast and jump off that backside and fall a pretty good ways before you land in sand and slide on down. It's pretty cool. Um, but yeah, there is uh, a slipward, slip face on the leeward side. Um, on the windward side, there's a, a more gradual slope up to the dune. And that's what makes sand dunes. Here's a picture of a sand dune. This is actually in White Mountains where I was walking around. And this is, of course, the, the leeward side. The windward side's on the other side. So the sand kind of bounces its way up, this gradual slope. And on the back side of it here, it, it has little sand avalanches that come down. And you can walk along the tops of these and kind of jump a little bit, and the whole thing will just slide down. Uh, you got to be careful, though, because people actually have been buried by these before. And they're not real easy to get out of or breathe underneath of, right? Um, but it is really pretty neat. Here's uh, some cross bedding uh, in uh, Zion National Park, famous park here in Utah. And you can see the angles of the, of the bedding planes. This is rock. So these are an ancient sand dunes that formed sandstone. And, you, and we can actually determine by looking at those the direction the wind was blowing. Because we know on the gradual slope, the wind was blowing up that. And on the steep slope, the wind the, the, was the direction away from the wind. Kind of neat. It's a beautiful place to walk around. Okay, let's talk the types of sand dunes. I think I've got here. Make sure I'm following along with your questions here. Uh, yeah, hopefully you've answered that uh, that last question there. Okay. Yes, yeah, so those angled layers there that angle down like that are known as cross beds because they're not. They're not level with Earth's gravity, right? They're not layered like they should be in a sedimentary rock. They're going across that direction. So those are called cross beds. Okay, let's talk types of sand dunes. There are many, many types of sand dunes. 
I'm not going to describe all of them. We're just going to look at a couple, OK? Um, the reason that you get a certain type of sand dune versus another type of sand dune has a, a couple of factors involved. One is, first of all, how much sand you've got. Guys, please. One is how much sand you've got. You have to have a certain amount of sand, OK? And you'll get a different dune depending on how much material you have to work with. The other is how fast the wind is blowing. blowing. And does it blow from the same direction at all times? Or does it shift directions throughout the year? Or does it blow from more than two directions and blow from many, many different directions? And every one of those features, along with how much vegetation there is to stop the sand dune from moving, give you a totally different looking sand dune. And some areas of the world have like, you don't just have one type of sand dune. You have many different types in the same desert region, right? In the same dune field. So let's look at a couple of these. The first one here is called a star dune. These have three or more arms. And the reason you get a star dune is because wind blows from many different directions, maybe throughout the day, throughout the year. Um, wind comes from different directions, so it builds up the sand dune going different ways. And you've got, of course, different slip faces and things like that on this thing uh, because the winds keep coming from different directions. These dunes tend to not migrate. They tend to just sit there and get taller. Makes sense, right? They're known as star dunes. These types of dunes are called parabolic dunes. Uh, and they happen when strong winds erode a section of, of sand with vegetation in it. So there has to be like little plants there okay, in what we call a blowout. And we just talked about those. What will happen with this is the vegetation will kind of hold the arms of the dune, the edges of the dune in place, while the main body of the dune, um, known as the nose, kind of migrates forward. So it gives it this weird parabolic shape where the, the edge, the, the arms of the dune actually point back almost towards where the wind's coming from, which is kind of contra counterintuitive. Let's watch this thing form here. See, the wind blows out, and then these arms start to form. The wind direction's indicated by that arrow there. So the vegetation's holding the arms in place, and the dune's migrating to the right there. So the center section of the dune keeps moving, but the arms kind of drag behind it. That's known as a parabolic dune. Let's take a look at a, um, a Barkin dune. So these are uh, areas where you've got real flat sand fields with no vegetation growing on it. And the wind always blows from one direction. So the wind doesn't change direction. And there's limited sand to work with. Okay? So these Barkin dunes are uh, kind of interesting. They're almost the reverse of the parabolic one. Notice how if the wind's coming from the left over here, okay, the sand avalanche there comes down the slip face on the back side from the wind, but the arms here point in the direction of the wind. So other than that, they really do look a lot like the parabolic dunes. There's no vegetation though, so the arms get swept the same direction that the wind's blowing. And the dune migrates, of course, to the right. So it moves slowly to the right. Um, dune migration, by the way, is not a small thing. Uh, it can be a, 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 a troublesome thing for humans because if dunes migrate in an area that you're not used to having them migrate, they can bury whole buildings. Like Sleeping Bear Dune up in Michigan migrated and ate some houses. They just go over top of them. I was in a sand dune field out in Oregon, out behind this Walmart, and they had dump trucks back there and huge like skid loaders and stuff. And they were, they were like scooping the sand up and dumping it in these uh, dump trucks to take it away because the sand dunes were migrating and they literally were going to eat the Walmart. It was over top of their parking lot and everything. And I'm assuming like once a month or something, they just have to go back there and dig out the whole sand dune that has migrated onto their parking lot to keep it from eating Walmart. Uh, so like dune migration, it's a, it's a very real thing. And especially if we deforest an area, if we cut it down, the dunes move faster or start moving. And that's something that Michigan and northern Indiana deal with, is if they deforest those slopes by the dunes, um, towns are going to disappear. The sand dunes will just start moving, and they'll go over top of towns. Here's a transverse dune. And uh, this happens when a Barkhan dune, um, when a bunch of them start to align and join into long ridges. So those are really a bunch of Barkhan dunes, uh, but they've built kind of ridges, as you can see here. So those are, those are known as transverse dunes. Transverse dunes. 
the wind would be coming from the left over there in that picture. I think another one here. Yep. And a, a reversing dune is kind of a neat thing. A reversing dune forms when the winds reverse direction throughout the year. So these things can get really big. They don't tend to migrate because what's going to happen, you're going to see here, is wind's going to blow from one direction for a while. And then usually halfway throughout the year, the wind shifts direction and blows from exactly the reverse direction. So it's like the sand starts mounding up one way, and then the wind pushes it back the other way and mounds it up the other way. Let's watch along here as it kind of goes. Wind direction over there from the southwest, the dune creates. You get this slip face here at about 34 degrees, okay, on the leeward side of the, side of the dune. Okay. Looks like a classic Barkan dune. Now the wind blows some more, okay? Wind reverses, okay? And now the dune is gonna change its morphology. It's gonna shift back the other direction, see that? So we start forming a slip face on the other direction. And it continues to grow there. So that's the reason that these dunes, these really tall stationary dunes, known as reversing dunes, can get so tall is because the wind just keeps kind of mounding it back and forth, okay? That's the reason they can quite get so big. And they also make these cool things called, known as Chinese walls, um, where there's like this ridge across the top of these things uh, that avalanche is like really easy. They're pretty cool to see. Okay, so that's it for sand and sand dunes and deserts. Go ahead and submit your quiz there.